Oh, Father God, we thank you for who you are to us. We thank you for your great love towards us, that even when we were sinners, you made a way. You made a way for us to return to you. Oh, I thank you that the door is open between us, that there's nothing standing in the way between us and you. So, Father God, I pray over every heart in the room, those that are close to you and those that may be far away. I pray, Holy Spirit, remind us in this moment that you've made a way for us to return to you, for us to be close to you, and for us to know you. Oh, we thank you, Jesus.
singing about our Father. And that is who you are. That is who I believe it. We're standing on your faithfulness, God. We're standing on your promises. We're standing on your promises. Singing about the character of God. That is who He's a promiser. That is who you are. He's a God that of His word. Is who you are. He's faithful. That He's is trustworthy. We can lean on Him. He'll never fail us. That He'll never, never forsake us. He will always keep us. That is who you He's a promise are. keeper.
launched a brand new series last week called No Strings Attached, and it has absolutely nothing to do with NSYNC. I need you to understand that, all right? We've been, we've been talking about it. This is a series on generosity. I don't know if you, if you realize this or not, but generosity is a tenet of the Christian faith. You don't get to be a Christian and say, I'm not going to be generous. It doesn't work. Generosity is a part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And this is why. He was generous. And we are called to follow after him. He was generous. You say, well, I don't know if he was generous. Look what he did for you. You'd be dying and going to hell if it weren't for Jesus. But he reached out for you and me. And this is the generosity of God. And he calls us to be like him. Generosity is not an optional thing in Christianity. The irony of this is actually almost every religion of the world believes that you should be generous. Every religion Every religion believes that you should be generous, but in Christianity, it's not an option. It is a command that we are we are required to be generous. In fact, we found that giving when we give with strings attached, often this is what we do in our society. We give like, and if you do this, then I'm going to do this, and we have this like negotiation contract about the way that we give, and often it actually backfires on us. It backfires, but we are called to give without, and this is true generosity, to give without any agreement, without any strings attached, just let it go and say, I'm going to give. And there are times when I've given to people on the side of the street, and I'm like, they are going to use that for booze. I know it. And it's not my responsibility <laughs> to know this. Now, I've got to be wise, a good steward, if I know that I know that I know. But there have been times when I've given, and I'm like, I don't know what they're going to use this for, canes or cocaine. I don't know what's going to happen, all right? Like, I really don't know which one it's going to be. I think they put cocaine in their sauce, actually. It's pretty, that good. All right, anyway. One of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life, my, my family, we watch a lot of America's Funniest Home Videos. And I love when people, they show, they do it almost every season. They'll do a, a, a stint of where they have people that are using exercise bands, and they think it's attached to something, and then they go to pull it. And then it like hit, y'all see what I'm talking about? So have y'all, has anybody ever had that happen? Like you've got it on your foot and you're doing like a, a flex, weird flex or something like that. And it comes up and it just, bah, just like, and you don't know what to do. Like it's often some of y'all are elbowing people right now. Look, I, I love it. It's my favorite, it's my favorite time on America's Funniest Home Videos whenever they do this because it totally catches people by surprise. They've got this thing attached to something or they think it's attached to something and it backfires. Can I share something with you? When you give with no strings attached, when you are generous with no strings attached, you let go and the enemy gets that side of the exercise band. The enemy gets just whopped all of a sudden because they're like, I got them. They're going to hold this grudge until they get back what they were expecting after they gave this. And when you let go of it, they just get, the enemy just gets smoked in that moment. And the Satan doesn't know what to do with it. Last week, we talked about the number one thing that you need to be generous with. And if you don't get anything else from this series, you need to get this. You've got to be a forgiver. If you don't give forgiveness, look, it, again, generosity is a tenet of the Christian faith. It is a part of what it is. You, the Bible says, freely you've been given, freely you must give Forgiveness is something that you and I have been given by God. And many of us wait on the apology to forgive. Don't wait for an apology. It's about you. It's about you being free. Don't wait for the apology. Give it. If you have not listened to that podcast or you weren't here last week, go back and check it out. If you're watching online, hit pause. You can come back and watch this later. Go back and watch last week. It's that important. It's so important for you to forgive. 2 Corinthians Chapter 9 is what we've been using as our text for this series, and I want to read it to you real quick. And if you've got your Bible, get it out. If you've got a pen, I want you to underline some things because we're going we're gonna to do a whole lot of diving into the Word today, and I want you to be able to underline some stuff. If you've got an iPhone or an iBull or a Droid Bull, whatever it is, let's read it together. All right, 2 Corinthians 9, 10. And I like to read from the NLT. This is what I'm going to be reading now. It says, he who supplies, everybody say he. Come on, say he. He who supplies seed to the sower And bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. I think this is such a powerful scripture, and I think it's very easy for us to get focused on the wrong things in this scripture. I know Christians are notorious for quoting part of a Bible verse 
all the time. And we could easily see that part that says, you will be enriched in every way. Amen. <laughs> That's not the point of it. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. In other words, with every calling of God, with every benefit of God, there is a purpose of God too. With every provision of God, there is a point to that provision. With everything that God supplies, there is an end user that needs that. And a lot of times we convert what we think is our bread and we think it's our bread. But what God is really giving us is seed to be sown. Don't eat your seed because if you eat the seed, you won't have something to sow into tomorrow. And this is so important. He says, he who supplies seed to the sower. Notice it didn't say you supply seed to the sower. It said he, speaking of the Lord, he supplies, not you. Turn to your neighbor and say, not you. Not you, not your job. It's not your job that supplies it. Not your money that supplies it. He does. He supplies it. The enemy wants to cut you off from your supplier. The enemy wants to cut you off from your supplier. Who's the supplier? He is. He wants to separate you from the one that supplies seed to the sower. You're the sower. You're the one who plants and that harvest will come up. But the enemy wants to cut you off. If you, we were in military tactics, we wouldn't just go after the end person. We would try and figure out a way to cut the enemy off from the one that is supplying it with what it needs to attack. We would try to cut that off. And the enemy wants to cut you off from the one that supplies your every need from the one that supplies seed to the sower. He's trying to do this not by cutting you off in a, in, a, in a violent way. Do you know how he cuts you off? By making you think you need a different supplier. He provides a different supplier and says, hey, you can get a better deal over here. This one doesn't ask as much. Oh, somebody. This one doesn't ask as much of you as the other one does. That other supplier, what's his name, Jesus, he asked a little bit too much of you. This one doesn't ask as much of you. Come over here. And he's trying to cut you off from your supplier. Trying to cut you off. This is what I want to talk to you today for just a little bit about. I want to talk to you about knowing your supplier. Do you know your supplier? Do you know your supplier? Because if we don't know our supplier, there's no way we can do what God is asking us to do. For us to be generous, for us to give with no strings attached, we must know the one who is supplying what we are to give, what we are to be generous with. When I was a kid, my uncle David would do this thing. Every family reunion we'd come together, he would come up and he would walk up to you with one fist like this and one hand like this. And what he was doing is he had a pocket knife in his hand. He had a pocket knife in his hand. He would do this. And what he wanted you to do was pull your pocket knife out. We're all rednecks. And hold your fist over his open hand and your hand, open hand under his fist. And it was a blind swap. Now, some of y'all, this, this bothered me a little bit because sometimes I would have my favorite knife in my pocket. Like, I'm about to give up my favorite knife and I don't know what I'm about to get back. In fact, I know my Uncle David played some jokes on some of my family members and just had like some jank, rusted up, unopenable knife. You know what I mean? Like, like and put it in their hands. But he would do this blind swap. Now, what you may not know about my Uncle David, it may seem crazy for you to do a blind swap like this, but what you may not know about him is my Uncle David had one of the nicest knife collections of anybody I've ever seen, the largest and the nicest. He had knives that were extremely rare. He knew he could tell you just by opening the blade, he could tell you this one was made in this year. Oh, and the company burned down. The building burned down after they made that knife. He could tell you history, all this stuff. He knew knives. So when I got to know what my uncle knew and knew what was in his, oh, somebody, when I knew what was in his possession, I was happy to go, yes, <laughs> let's go. Because what I've got is worth the nothing. <laughs> and what you've got, maybe it doesn't matter. It's going to be better. There's going to be a story behind this knife. There's going to be some to this. Oh, somebody, listen, when I got to know the supplier, I was perfectly fine with swapping out what I had, what I thought I owned with what he had. When I got to know the supplier, everything changed. When I began to trust the giver, I was open to giving. And some of us don't trust the ultimate giver, the one who gave us life. We don't yet trust him, so we're not open to being generous with our own lives because we think it's ours. 
Here's what I want you to write down if you're taking notes. This is worth writing down. If you get nothing else, get this today. God's not after what's in your hand. He's after your heart. I learned this about my uncle. My uncle could care less. You realize he probably never got the good end of the deal when he did the switch. He was like, okay, let's go throw that one in the garbage. Like he never got the good end of the deal. He wasn't after what was in my hand. You know what he wanted? He wanted memories to be made between all of the nephews and all the kids and all the stuff. He wanted us to remember him by the guy with the knives. That's cool. He didn't do this with any of the girls. It was a dude thing. It's like, yes, come on. That's what he, he was after my heart. He wasn't after what was in my hand. Can I share something with you? Some of you, you've been so, you've thought that giving was so abused in maybe other churches, you've heard it. And the church has really done a disservice to giving because we go from one pendulum swing to the other. One generation, we're like, you must give everything you got. <laughs> Take your shirt off now. <laughs> <laughs> And we go from one pendulum to the other pendulum. We just don't talk about giving at all in the church. Can I share something with you? If you think money's important, so does God. So does God. Do you know why God thinks it's important? Because it's actually keeping you from him. You've changed suppliers somewhere along the way from thinking that God supplies to thinking money supplies. And God does not like that. He wants there to be a connection. Money's not bad. you got to understand this. Money is not wrong. Christians have even taught it that far wide that you should not have money. You need to live as a poor person. That's not true. But if it begins to get in the way of who God is, God's not after what's in your hand. But he is after your heart. And he will want you to sacrifice what's in your hand until your heart surrenders to him. Until your heart surrenders to him. River Park is a generous church. I, I, maybe you know that. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're not one of the participants. So you're like, I don't know if we are or not. <laughs> River Park is a very generous church. We give generously. I get letters all the time from organizations in our town talking about you, saying how much you have blessed their organization, not just with money, but with their, your time, with serving them, with doing all kinds of things. We are a generous church. And sometimes we think it's this taboo topic to talk about money in church. But if money gets in the way of your heart, it's not. It's actually a salvation thing. If it's in the way of your heart, it's blocking you from what God wants in your life. It's blocking you. Here's the bottom line, guys. If you're wondering whether or not, and you're thinking, man, at the end of this service, he's going to ask for an offering. No. (laughs) I'm not. (laughs) So just quit worrying about it. Turn to your neighbor and say, relax. (laughs) Like, I'm not asking you to burn your wallet at the end of this sermon, all right? Like, turn in your credit cards. I'm not doing that. This isn't Dave Ramsey. Calm down for a second, all right? Like, I want you, I want you to relax for a minute. I'm not asking you to do anything. What I'm asking you to do is to open your heart to what God is saying about this. Because so many times we hear the G word, not God, give, in church. And it's, it's like all of a sudden we're like, I, 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 different church. <laughs> Some of y'all, that's why you here. <laughs> oh, man, my bad. Is that too soon? My fault. <laughs> hey, listen, listen. We've got to understand that God's not after what's in your hand. He is after your heart. So if you got your Bible, and again, I want you to underline some things because gonna, I'm going gonna to do something I've never do, guys. Most of the time when I preach, I, I paraphrase Scripture and then go back and read highlighted points in Scripture. I cannot do this with this. I'm going to read a long passage of scripture. I highlight scripture in my notes as blue. The entire page right now is blue, okay? So like, I'm going to read this long passage of scripture. We're going to go back and explain it. So if you got a Bible, you can check it out, but it'll be on the screen behind me. It's Matthew 19. It says this. It's verse 16. If you're looking to follow along with me, it says this. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do? Everybody underline I do if you're underlining your Bible. What good deed must I do? Say I do. Thank you, we're getting married. Uh, What good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. I love the way Jesus is just kind of like tongue in cheek, this thing right here. There's only one who is good. But to answer your question, and the Jesus just can't help himself. I'm I'm gonna give it to you, man. To answer your question, if you wanna receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Underline that in your Bible. Keep the commandments. This is pretty simple. 
And I love this dude. And this is such a legalistic thing. This dude had to have been an attorney. He says, which ones? <laughs> Look, can I share something? Here's a good sign that you're not willing to follow Jesus wherever when you start negotiating which commandments he gave to follow. <laughs> Which ones do you want me to follow? What is the minimum thing that I have to do to attain our eternal life, Lord? Which commandments get me into heaven? I don't want any of the other stuff. Uh-oh. Just that. That's what he says. Which ones? This is the question he asked. Now i got to find my spot again. The man asked, and Jesus replied, you must not murder. And he's like, Check. You must not commit adultery, check. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. Did you notice how progressively it got harder to say check? <laughs> Don't murder. Oh, that's easy. Don't commit adultery. Yeah, I'm good. Honor your father. Uh-oh. <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says something that I couldn't even say on this. He says, I've obeyed all these commandments. The young man replied, what else must, everybody say it with me, I do. What else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad for he had many possessions then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich, for the rich, excuse me, for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astonished. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Now, I need you to understand a couple of things about this, and I'm going to break this open, and we're going to go back through it. So if you got your Bible, just keep it open right there. You realize that we don't find Jesus telling any of the other disciples to sell all they have before they follow him. Yet we have built theology. There are people that have built theology around to follow Jesus. You must sell everything you got to follow him. Nowhere. Go find it. You want to challenge me on it? Go find it in scripture where he looks at somebody and says, sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and follow me. In fact, we know Peter still had a boat. Because after he denies Jesus, he goes back fishing. <laughs> we know this stuff. And often we want to go into this theology that you must give everything away. He didn't ask anybody else of this. Let me tell you something else. Very few people did Jesus even ask to follow him. Most people, he would do a thing for them and say, go back home. <laughs> I don't like you. He didn't say that. <laughs> go back home. Go tell someone else. Go do this thing. But Jesus invites this guy to follow him. I love the first thing that the man says. He said, what must I do? And I want you to get this. If you're taking notes, he sees himself as his own supplier. What must I do to get eternal life? I am the supplier of what I want to accomplish in my life. I am well. Remember, it says he's a rich young man. He's done well for himself. He says, what must I do? I've done a lot. What must, what much, how much more should I do to get what you want to offer, Lord. And Jesus simply says, keep the commandments. He just says, hey, you just got to keep the commandments. Follow the commandments. And then he lists the ones that have nothing to do with God but with others. I don't know if you caught that. If you follow the Ten Commandments, if you know the Ten Commandments, there are six of them that have to do with this horizontal relationship with man. There are four of them that have to do with a vertical relationship with the Lord. When Jesus says, keep the commandments, and he says, which ones? Jesus does not mention one single commandment that has to do with this. He says, all of the ones that do this, he says, all right, this, this, honor your father and mother, don't murder somebody, don't commit adultery. He just gives all these horizontal relationships. And then the guy says, I've done all that. Jesus knew that. It was a loaded question. He knew that was cool. he was going to be able to say that. And he says, well, if you want to be perfect, you're missing one thing. What is the one thing? Not one commandment. One element of the 10, there's this vertical relationship that you don't have right right now, bro. And we got to get it right because I'm after your heart, not what's in your hand. But in order for me to get to your heart, you got a big problem. I need you to sell all you've got. 
because you don't have this vertical relationship with the Lord, right? You don't have this thing figured out. He says, sell all you have because you're relying on money and yourself as your supplier, and the Lord needs to be your supplier. Sell all you have. He's saying, give up your supplier so I can become your supplier. Now, those of you that are astute and have read the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, you know the Ten Commandments. You've heard the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments is you will have no other You'll have no other gods before me. That's one of the Ten Commandments. It's one of the staples of the Ten. And when the Lord says, if you want to be perfect, when Jesus looks at him and says, if you want to be perfect, you got to get the vertical right. He had not mentioned anything about God yet. But in this moment, he says, if you want to get everything right, you got to get this relationship with God. You can't have any other gods before him. No other gods. God's not after what's in your hand. He's after your heart. He wants you to connect to him. Remember what we read earlier? It says, he is the supplier of the seed. He supplies, not money. He doesn't, can you, y'all know that God doesn't need your money, right? I think we, we're confused by that sometimes. God does not need your money. He wants your heart. God does not need your money. He wants your heart. When my kids were younger, uh, if you're a parent, you've probably done this. I would test my kids when they would get something they really wanted, like ice cream. I'd be like, can daddy have some? Come on, y'all know what I'm talking Anybody ever done that to your kids? Like, some of y'all have done that to your spouse. My wife. <laughs> Anybody ever been through a drive through Hey, you want anything? No. Okay. <laughs> Somebody said it. <laughs> like, that, that was great. Hey, you want anything? No, I don't want anything. So I get something, and then you start driving. I get like an ice cream cone. You're driving away. Hey, can I have some? No. <laughs> you said you didn't want anything. Look, it's this test. It's almost like, so I just learned to order. You want anything? No. All right, give me two of everything I order, please. Because she's going to ask for something. All right, like, it's going to happen. With my kids, I would test them. I'd be like, can daddy have some of your ice cream? And they would be like, if they were really hungry or really loved it, you know what? They'd be like, No. It's mine. Do you know who gave them the dang ice cream? They didn't do anything for that. They did the opposite of what they needed to do for that. They didn't deserve that. I gave them the ice cream. I should have been like, oh, you going to give daddy some ice cream or you're not getting any more. I can't do that with my wife. <laughs> Just, yeah, all right. Moving on. <laughs> Listen, here's the thing. Sometimes it would go really well, and they'd be like, here, Daddy, here's some ice cream. Other times it would go really bad, and I would get really mad, <laughs> like really bad. Here this past Sunday, a couple Sundays ago, this kid was walking out, and he had been like devouring this cookie. And he, I, walk, I just looked at him, and I said, I typically degree, love you, see me out there at the gate. And he comes walking by, and I say, hey, can I have some of that? Without hesitation, he just puts it in my hand. Now what am I going to do? And he's just looking at me like, are you going to eat it? And I'm like, bro, you got spit all up in this. Oh, man. Like, it, it, I did not expect that. I did not expect. I was just seeing if this kid was, like, willing. I didn't think he was going to say yes. I didn't expect that. Can I share something with you? Whenever God puts you in a situation where he is, he is the supplier, he is the one that gave it to you. When he's got it, sometimes when he asks for it, it's not because he needs it. It's never because he needs it. It's because he's seeing if your heart is on his side or not. You care about daddy? You care about what I want? This is what the Lord is asking sometimes of us. In Exodus chapter 25, I love the way this is worded. It says this, tell the people of Israel to bring me their sacred offerings. Accept the contributions from all whose hearts are moved to offer them. Not everyone, just those whose hearts want to give. He basically saying, don't even accept it from people that don't want to give. Because it's not the point. The point is, is the heart in it? Skip on down to verse 8, and it says, Have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary. Well, that sounds crazy. Why? So I can live among them. What's the motivation of everything that God asked for giving? So that he can be with you and be your supplier. He wants your heart. You know why giving is really, really hard? I'm about to tell you why giving is hard. Why everybody gets the pucker factor on level 9 when people talk about giving in church. Let me tell you why giving is hard. Because we think we're giving something that we already own. You actually think you own something. 
I actually think I own something. Giving is hard because I think I'm giving up my stuff. And we, go, we think we've matured since we were kids. We haven't. Mine. It's all mine. And God is not after what we think is ours. He's after our heart. Here's the thing. It is so easy to give when we recognize that it was never ours to begin with. When you're giving someone else's money away, it's easy. Ask my kids. It's so easy. When you are giving someone else's, the other night we were out to eat with some friends and Camilla comes to our table and she came to me because she knows I'm the only sucker in our family. And she said, can I have money for the gumball machines? By the way, <laughs> invest in gumball machines because gumballs never go they never expire, apparently. You can have a gumball machine from 1988, and the gum in it never dies. It's just, there, every other thing is regulated in our country except for gumball machines. And, like, you can have gumball machines of death from the 80s, and your kids are still eating them. To, it blows my mind. Anyway, so she comes up, and she says, can I have quarters? And now, there's a big group. We were here with a couple other families, and we all have a million kids, and they were all sitting at their own table, which is a nightmare for any waiter in the city, and I apologize for that in advance. But we, we give this money to Camilla, and she goes, and she redistributes and gives the money to all the kids for them to get gumballs. Do you know why it was so easy for Camilla to give money to all, everybody else at that table? Because it wasn't hers. <laughs> Little newsflash, she has her own money. She spent my money. You getting this? It was easy to give because she knew this is not my money to give. And she re recognized that she wasn't the supplier, nor was money the supplier. Did you know this? And this is so true. And I want you to get this. Money actually wants to replace God. Money wants to replace God. Wants to place her God. I don't have time to get into this, but if you want to do a unique study, money is actually the spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist is anything that is opposite of Christ, tries to be in the place of Christ. Money is the spirit of Antichrist, and this is why if you look in the book of Revelation, it says you can neither buy nor sell without this mark on you. It says you'll never, this is the idea of what money is. Without money, you can't buy and sell. It's the spirit of Antichrist. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Money wants to replace God. And this is what I've learned about money. Money is a great servant, but an unfaithful savior. Money will fail you time and time again if it tries to save you. Some of you know this. You've had deep savings accounts. And then everything falls apart. Everything falls apart. It's a horrible savior. It's a great servant. Don't burn your money. It's a fantastic servant. It'll serve you well. In fact, Solomon says money solves all things. As long as it stays in the servant position and not the savior position. The moment it steps into being the savior and trying to replace God is the moment that you have a God that will fail you. That you have a God that is based on economy. Money is a great supply, but it's not the supplier. Think about this. Money wants to replace God and it tries to do everything that God does for you. Think about what money does. Money gives you an identity. If you got a lot of money, you go out and you buy nice things. You go out and buy nice cars and you think, look, I'm somebody, people. And there's nothing wrong with nice things and nice cars as long as you're not relying on those things to give you your identity. Money, when you allow it to give you your identity, you said, it gives me my identity, not who God, what God says I am. Some of you are poor and you're allowing your status as a poor person to define your identity. And that just as well is a sin because you've allowed the lack of money to give you your identity. It's a false God. It's trying to replace God. It's trying to replace God. Well, if we had money. No, no, no. no. Money does not identify you. God does. You can't allow money to do that. Money tries to do other things. Money tries to say you're successful. When you have this much, you've become successful. But God is the one that defines success in your life, not money. Money is trying to replace God. It's trying to do what only God can do to the Christian. Because God is after your heart. And money tries to do it. Money tries to be your decision maker. You ever made a decision to take a job because it pays more money? God wants to be the one that filters your decision making. But money wants to say, no, 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 I'm going to move to Colorado because I can make more money there than I can here instead of going to God first 
and saying, God, what should I do? Money tries to replace God in every single way. And we often make these big decisions, make this. And you may think, Marcus, I don't really struggle with this. Why are we talking about it? Let me ask you a question. I've said this. I bet you have too. Have you ever said this? Man, I either need the Lord to come through or somebody to give me some money. Did you hear the comparison? I either need God or an alternative. Man, I either need the Lord to come through or I need to worship this other thing. Money is trying to replace God. This is what Luke 16, Jesus says this, no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You can't do both. You can't do both. Remember, money can be a great servant, but it's a horrible master. It's a horrible master. And he does this. And a lot of people think, and they they falsely quote the scriptures, money is the root of all evil. That is not what the Bible says. You know what the Bible says? The love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money. In other words, when you make money your master, it is the root of all evil. If money keeps its place where it's supposed to be, it's not the root of all evil. In fact, it'll fund the kingdom of God when it's in its right place. When you tell money to shut up and get in its spot. And that's what you get to do. That's what you get to do. But some translations don't say serve God and money. Some actually translate it this way. It says you cannot serve both God and mammon. Let me tell you you just a little Bible history real quick as we wrap up. Mammon was a a Syrian god. Mammon was the name of a Syrian god. And Mammon was the god of the Syrians that was the god of riches. He was the God of wealth and riches. So when Jesus says you can't serve both God, the one true God, and mammon, and praise him for getting you wealthy, he's saying you can't depend on two different suppliers. My God shall supply all your needs not just those that money can't fix not just those that are spiritual when we have cancer we go to this God but when we need money we go to this God no he says my God shall supply all your needs all your needs and the question that we have to ask ourselves one of my mentors says it this way he says you don't believe money has a spirit on it think about the expression money talks (laughs) If money talks, there's something animated behind it. Money talks. And one of my mentors told me this. He said, Marcus, the way we make money shut its mouth is we give it away. We give some of it away until it stops talking. And then we're like, okay, I'm good now. And for some of us, it doesn't take much to make money shut up. Some of us, it may take a lot to make money shut up. Because we've allowed it to become our identity. We've allowed it to define our success. We've allowed it to make our decisions for us and replace God as our supplier. But he wants to be our supplier. The question we have to ask is, do I serve money? Or do I serve the Lord with my money? With my money. We have to know our supplier. We have to know our supplier. We're horrible tooth fairies at my house. Horrible tooth fairies. My kids, by the way, if you got young kids in here, I'm about to ruin everything. Okay, sorry. Spoiler alert. My kids know that there's no tooth fairy. They've known, I think since they were born, uh, that there was no tooth fairy. By the way, Shaw the other day uh, says that he wants to be Santa Claus for Halloween, which I think is awesome. So, (laughs) So we're excited about that. I can't wait for that. Uh. That's fantastic. (laughs) But they've known that there's no tooth fairy for a long, long time. And, uh, And so whenever they don't end up with money under their pillow, they don't get mad at the tooth fairy. <laughs> they get mad at mom and dad. <laughs> and what we do is we try and deflect. You know, they come in, and the other day, Letty lost one of her big front teeth, and she's like, oh, like, came in, and she said, she walked straight in, and she goes, you forgot to give me money. <laughs> and immediately, immediately, I said, immediately I deferred. I said, that stupid tooth fairy, can you believe That tooth fairy, just so ridiculous. How could they forget you, lady? And she goes, I know it's you. (laughs) Man. 
How shameful would it be for us to wake up and think that what was supplying our every need was something that could never meet our every need? See, some of us have grown up in a society where we deflect and we think that this thing was providing for us when it was actually something that is not even on that level, something far above all the things of this earth, something far above. It is the Lord that supplies every need, not these things. And sometimes when these things get in the way and we've elevated them to God's status, we have to lower them down a little bit. And we do that through generosity. Generosity is not an option for the Christian, not because it's something that God wants us to do to make the world a better place because it's something he wants to do to make you a better place for him to live it's not something that God wants to do he says take that thing that you've elevated to God's status and chop it down to size to where you can stand on it and say this is my platform to proclaim that that is the one true God it's him this is what generosity does generosity is not an option for the Christian We don't get to blame the tooth fairy. We look to God and the good and the bad. God, I'm going through a lot right now. God, I'm struggling right now. I need you. I don't need money or God. I need you, Lord. And if you choose to answer it through money, then do it. If you choose to answer it through another way, do it. I trust you, God. Would you stand all around the room today? Here's the beauty of what God wants to do with your generosity. It's the moment that you begin to declare him God, it's the moment you will see yourself identified as who you're truly supposed to be. Some of us have false identities because we've been living under an assumption that money identifies us. And there's nothing more frustrating than living an identity that is not true. Some of us have false idea of success. We think we're unsuccessful and we, we go to bed miserable every night. Because we think we're unsuccessful because we don't have money. But you're allowing money to define success. Let God do that. Some of us are making decisions and you don't know what to make. Because you're thinking, you know what? If I make this, I can make more money. If I do this, I'm not going to have money. I may want to do this. And you're allowing God to stay far away from you. are keeping him from the decision making in this. And what I'm telling you is the moment that you make your money your servant instead of your master, suddenly in that moment, God begins to say, you're a child of God. Hear my voice. You're a son and a daughter of God. You are loved. You're good. And you know what we say in those moments? We sing what we sang earlier. Jaira, you are enough. You're my supplier. You're my provider. Not money. Not money. Y'all, this past year, we lost more trees than there are in Shreveport, Louisiana at our house. We have a rent house. It's our first house that we ever bought. We turned into a rent house. We lost almost every tree on that property and had to pay an ungodly amount of money to have those stupid things removed past couple of storms and even when it's not storming we've lost we lost a tree the other night uh in our backyard just took out our fence everything like that every time one of those things comes sometimes what i go is all i see is bank account going down and i'm like oh man but can i share something with you when the lord reminds you that your supply does not come from whether or not you have enough in your bank account to cover something but your supply comes from the lord that's when you can be used by god That's whenever you pray. If he's giving you your identity and says, you're a giver, and you look at your bank account and go, no, I'm not. And God says, you're generous. And you go, I don't know where from. You realize that you don't own anything. Your house isn't yours. Your family's not yours. Your money's not yours. Your 401k plan's not yours. None of that is yours. You may have thought it was yours, and if you allow it to continue to think it's yours, it will become your God. But the moment you surrender it to the Lord is the moment he begins to identify some things in you and calls you who you are. If you need prayer for anything, maybe you've got the spirit of mammon on your money and you need deliverance from that, come forward. We want to pray with you. If you need to go, get on out of here. I want you to go with the Lord and know that he is God, not money. Money's a great servant. It's a horrible God. God's the one for you. Father, I pray for your people today. As we leave this place, let us leave knowing you, knowing more and more about you, God, so that we can walk out of here more than conquerors. 
not just conquerors, more than conquerors, not just winners on the battlefield, but ready to face tomorrow because we've more than conquered the enemy. We can actually go through the next day. We didn't deplete all of our energy on the fight. We can walk the walk after the fight because you have given us the ability to do so, Lord. So help us to walk into everything you're calling us for. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. God bless you.